So, ladies and gentlemen, um, it is my privilege today to introduce our guest speaker, Mr. John Richards, the chair of the Bloomfield Group. John is no stranger to the majority of the room, having been a featured name in the region's coal history in recent decades. John is a former director of Port Waratah Coal Services, as well as a former chair of the New South Wales Minerals Council. Join, John joined Bloomfield in 2002, and in 2010, he was appointed Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer. In 2016, he transition, transitioned to Chair of Bloomfield. Bloomfield Group operates two mines in the region, including Rixus Creek, northwest of Singleton, and the Bloomfield Mine, east of Maitland. Bloomfield is a founding member and shareholder of Port Waratah Coal Services, with coal from the company's two mines shipped through Port Waratah. So John's also a customer of mine. Um, in June, John was named the winner of the Outstanding Contribution to Mining Award at the New South Wales Min Mining Industry and Supplier Awards in what was a very popular choice for the within the industry. Please join me this afternoon in welcoming John. Let's see how this microphone goes. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the traditional country of the Awabakal and Waramai people, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. My name's John Richards, and I'm chairman of the Bloomfield Group. And as Henny has explained, Bloomfield is a coal mining and engineering business in the Hunter, which employs 550 people. We've been in business since 1937, and we intend to stay in business for that long again. Now, I've been invited here today because I had the honour of receiving the award for the outstanding contribution to mining in New South Wales this year. It was a big year for Bloomfield. I was overshadowed completely by Renata Roberts, who not only won the New South Wales Award, but then went on to win the National Award for the Exceptional Woman in Resources. So I was a bit peeved, but anyway, <laughs> I decided I've been invited by Bob to speak today, so I put on my suit and my tie. It's the first time I've worn a suit and tie and talked to a group of people since February. And Congratulations on you all arriving here today to listen to me. <laughs> You're very, very wise. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about the impact that COVID has had on the mining industry and how we've responded. And then I want to talk a little bit about the broader efforts of the industry, especially in relation to lowering emissions. I'll start with the role in one of that one industry organisation, the New South Wales Minerals Council. And that has kept the wheels of industry turning during the pandemic. I chaired this organisation for two years, and I believe it does a great job providing value to its members. Right from the start, the New South Wales Minerals Council realised the most important thing was to understand how the industry could keep the community and workers safe while still trying to provide necessary services to the economy generally. The Minerals Council was at the leading edge of developing those new COVID guidelines that, uh, in cooperation with the Minerals Council of Australia, have been adopted worldwide, um, Australia-wide. Mining is a key local industry. And health and safety is our top priority. Especially as we fight coronavirus. We're following strict advice from health authorities and implementing new measures. Like increased health testing and cleaning, more protective clothing. Physical distancing, travel limits, shift changes and more. We're doing everything possible to protect our workmates and our families. We're also doing our bit to help the economy. So as you can see, industry worked together on distancing protocols on site, transport protocols, provision of protective equipment, protocols for changing shifts on site, restrictions at state borders for mine workers, 
uh, the interaction of current respirable dust safeguards and a lot more. When you think about it, mines can work in some of the more remote parts of Australia. And although the Hunter is not necessarily one of them, sometimes it feels like one, um, any failure of the mining industry to keep workers safe in any part of Australia would have had repercussions in the local industry here. Some of the communities in the more remote areas are also considered to be some of the more vulnerable parts of the population. And they're a long way from specialist care if they get sick. So across the state, the mining industry has taken its responsibility seriously, restricted its operations to the essential work only, and concentrated on reducing face-to-face -face contact. In remote locations, fly-in, fly-out workforces have been supported to temporarily relocate to, host, uh, to local host towns and cities to reduce the fly-in, fly-out. The video I played was the first stage of the work that the Minerals Council did to make sure that the community understood what industry has been doing. And if you roll forward six months, the Minerals Council have supported a community information campaign with a clear goal of keeping our communities safe and the economy moving. It's been a tough year. And without mining, it'd be a lot tougher. The mines have kept going. And that's helped keep our state going with the help of our COVID safe practices. Keeping over 40,000 miners, mining families, suppliers, and our communities safe. And we'll keep doing it. Which means thousands of local businesses like this can keep operating. And our New South Wales economy moving. And this work that the New South Wales Minerals Council did was complemented by that partnership that New South Wales Mining has with the Newcastle Knights. And we were all rewarded this year, finally, with a gritty Newcastle Knights victory, 12-0 over the North Queensland Cowboys in round 15. Thank you, Katie, wherever she is. <laughs> Appreciated that. Um, and I, I mean, this year, the New South Wales Mining Industry and in the Hunter, as I was talking to Bob before, that means a lot of us has had to quickly adapt and innovate, as we've seen on those videos. And the great response from the industry shouldn't come as a surprise, as we've had a pretty strong track record of adapting and being part of the answer. Through the New South Wales Minerals Council, I also hold a position on the board of Coal Innovation New South Wales designed to administer the New South Wales Government's investments in technologies to lower emissions in the coal industry. It's moved around a little bit, but now sits under the Department of Regional New South Wales in the Mining, Exploration and Geoscience Division. As you see, I'm pretty good with all those acronyms. Coal Innovation New South Wales has funded a large number of smaller technical projects which look at ways of reducing emissions from energy generation, steel making and cement manufacture. It's undertaken significant modelling around the future mix of electricity generation, concentrating on the whole system cost as well as the energy cost, and looking to understand the future of the grid. And finally, it has devoted considerable effort to understanding the challenges that come with addressing fugitive emissions in the coal mining industry. However, its most important work has been to search for a suitable carbon storage site in New South Wales. This has not proven to be a simple task, with difficulties on the ground being matched by administrative delays. However, this early search has yielded a site in the Darling Basin, and this is Pondy Range out near Will Canyon. Uh, an initial drilling has indicated quite promising results. Further drilling is planned to confirm the value of the site as a future carbon storage site. One of the bodies that have also spent some time in and now chair is called LETA, Low Emission Technology Australia. And you will see this logo a little more next year. 
This organisation has been through some recent changes when it revamped its constitution and renamed itself from formerly being Coal 21. Prior to that, it had been called ACOLET, or the Australian Coal Association Low Emission Technology Proprietary Limited. It's been working on low emissions since 2006, when it was begun by the Australian Coal Association. The funding for this organisation comes from the black coal producers in Eastern Australia, who pay a voluntary lever, levy to Letter. The interest from Letter in low emission technologies is broad and it covers areas from carbon capture and storage, carbon dioxide utilisation, alternative energy generation methods, fugitive emission reduction technologies and support for research organisations like ANLEC R&D and the Victorian based CO2 Cooperative Research Centre. However, it's probably fair to say that the current focus has been on exploring the potential for carbon capture and storage, with or without the potential to use the captured carbon dioxide in other industry. And just to give you a bit of a picture of why carbon capture and storage is interesting to us and should be to you, I want to give you a, a bit of a worldwide look just at the major carbon capture storage projects. We start with one of the oldest carbon capture storage facilities in the world, and this is the Sleipner field in Norway, where the Norwegian government has been one of the investors in the capture of carbon dioxide from the Sleipner gas fields and its storage in deep saline aquifers. This field has been operating since 1996 and is currently storing 850,000 tonnes of CO2 per year. In this case, the CO2 has been captured by splitting it off from the natural gas coming from the gas field using an amine technology and the CO2 is being stored in deep saline aquifers on site there in the North Sea. Now the amine process, process that I'm referring to is a, a long understood chemical looping reaction where CO2 is added to an amine at low temperature and then is released at a high temperature. So you get a closed circuit process which captures and then releases the CO2 when required. But the energy cost to drive that heat provide the heat and to drive the process is part of the capital and operating cost of, CA, uh, of carbon capture and storage facilities around the world. Similarly, here, another, another Norwegian operation at Snovit, which is situated on the, on the shore at Melkoya Island, is in the Barents Sea oil field in Norway. The gas processing facility has been capturing CO2 from the natural gas production facilities using amine technology here since 2008. And it's only capturing currently 700,000 tonnes per year. The CO2 is compressed, pumped through a subsea pipeline 153 kilometres into a saline geological reservoir in the North Sea under the gas fields. So then in, in Canada, this is the Sask Power Boundary Dam Facility in Saskatchewan, Canada. Now, it's another very important project. It was begun in 2014 and it's captured 500,000 to, to a million tonnes of CO2 per year. Now, this is different because it is capturing CO2 from a power station. And that power station supplies power to 100,000 Saskatchewan homes. Now the process, again, uses, this time it's Shell's can solve amine technology, absorbs and captures the CO2 in the, in the power station flue gas stream, and then the captured CO2 is pumped to an ageing oil field and paid for by oil companies to inject into the oil field to repressurise the field 
and allow oil and gas to be extracted at more affordable rates. This is a tried and tested technology in the oil business called Enhanced Oil Recovery, EOR. Now in the process of re-injecting the gas into these reservoirs, the amount of CO2 which is permanently stored is nearly 100% because any CO2 which comes up with the oil or gas is captured again and repumped back into the reservoir. In this case, the CO2 is transported as a supercritical fluid, which when I looked it up, I think it means liquid, <laughs> 66 kilometres to the Weyburn oil field. Now, during the month of August 2020, Boundary Dam captured 78,127 tonnes of CO2 and was up and running for 98% of the time. And since its start, the unit has captured 3,556,799 tonnes of CO2. So if we move to Texas, here's a project called Petronova in Thompson's, Texas, which is the world's largest post-combustion capture demonstration. It's designed to capture from 1.2 to 1.4 million tonnes of CO2 per annum, and it uses a different amine system. This one's called the KS1 amine solvent. But just like technology improvements in other industries, the improvement in amine technology continues to increase the efficiency of the capture process. Again, this project is using the CO2 for an en enhanced oil recovery by selling it on to the West Ranch oil field in Jackson County by piping it as a liquid over the 132 kilometre pipeline to the destination. Now during the year, following the sharp drop in oil prices and demand after the outbreak of COVID-19, the CO2 capture and storage at Petronova have been suspended and it's unclear at this, at this stage when it will reopen. But its supporters have pointed out that its closure was not related to faults in its technology and the project remains a pioneer in carbon capture utilisation and storage retrofitted to an existing power station. Closer to home, what's happening in Australia? Let's start in Western Australia with the Gorgon project in Barrow Island. This, pro this project, a CCS project, is capable of capturing 3.4 million to 4 million tonnes of CO2 per year, again using uh, BASF amine technology. It had a bit of a slow start, being delayed from 2018 to 2019, but it's now operating well and is capturing carbon from the production of natural gas, where natural gas and CO2 are found together mingled in the gas field and the CO2 is stripped away from the natural gas in the production process. And this CO2 here in, in Barrow Island is then transported a short distance as a liquid and injected into a deep saline geological reservoir where it's st stored for the long term. The storage is monitored with ongoing observation wells and seismic surveys and I think it leads then to the question of what's happening in Eastern Australia. The biggest previous project in the low emissions technology space was the Calide Oxyfuel project in Queensland. This was funded by the then Accolette, now Letter, and a number of partners including federal and state governments, Japanese companies and some Australian industry partners. An oxy combustion unit was retrofitted to one of the Calide power station units in southeast Queensland, and the aim was to capture carbon from a power station by burning the coal in pure oxygen and having the flue gas then consisting of almost 100% carbon dioxide. A special boiler was needed to do this, and the Japanese partners were able to provide the equipment required. The unit ran for nearly 10,000 hours 
and the technology was proved without doubt. And in th this early example, the required, the, the captured carbon wasn't stored in any reservoir and the project was just designed to assess the feasibility of the capture system. It highlighted the lack of suitable greenhouse gas legislation at the time and the importance of locating suitable storage sites. That has led through a slow pathway to the most promising current projects on the books in Australia. Currently being supported by Letter and the Australian Government and it's called the Glencore CTSCO project in the Surat Basin. And this project aims to build a carbon capture plant at Milmerran Power Station and it's attracted the attention of government. Wouldn't you know it? Politicians love to get a photo taken, especially in front of a power station. The captured CO2 would be liquefied and transported to a storage site where it will be injected into a deep, thick layer of precipice sandstone which lies under a hard, impervious layer of capping rock. The well that's been drilled into this sandstone is 2,500 metres deep and the fact that it's actually been completed is a significant achievement and follows from a long history of investigation, regulatory change and previous stepping stone projects. So the drilling was actually funded by ANLEC R&D which in itself is funded 50% by letter and 50% by the federal government. And this is the first drill hole in Australia specifically designed and approved to ascertain the potential for CO2 injection. And the storage site, called EPQ10, is capable of storing up to 3 billion tonnes of C CO2 and this particular well is capable of storing up to 10 million tonnes per year. The project itself is aiming to only store 120,000 tonnes per year. And we were initially concerned about whether we'd be able to actually identify a plume of CO2 when you put it down that far. But work done by the CO2, CO2 Cooperative Research Centre in Victoria has confirmed that we can see as little as 5,000 tonnes of CO2 injected into a reservoir. And both CO2 CRC and ANLEC have done some really good work on CO2 storage sites and their work will be the future key to carbon capture and storage. So in summary, EPQ10, this one in, uh, in Queensland is a large site, has enormous potential and we hope that the necessary government approvals will allow the project to progress. There are lots of other projects, some started, some stopped, some working, some not. What I want to try and do perhaps is just draw the lessons from the work that we've been undertaking to try and make low emissions technology is a little more understandable. I think we need to understand why we think they're important. And we've... The de debate about the future of energy in Australia has really been dominated by the single largest sector, which is the electricity generation sector. And here we've had some hard-fought battles over energy policy, where hydroelectricity, wind power, solar power, gas-fired power and coal-fired power have all been in the midst of the battle, some coming out with more scars than other. And this battle that pits energy sources against each other has, a, has inevitably meant that the debate has concentrated more on the method of reaching the goal of low emissions rather than the goal itself. It's almost as if we've been approaching the problem with the blinkers on. And the recent announcement by uh, the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Angus Taylor, of the Technology Investment Roadmap has been welcomed by the industry and the people I work with because it's broadened the support for 
for government for programs like carbon capture and utilisation or storage, where emissions from industrial sources can be reduced. In fact, the government is committed to developing a methodology where carbon capture and storage can bid for Australian car carbon capture units or ACCUs under the Emissions Reduction Fund and more more clearly, the government has announced they would seek legislative change to allow for CCS and other low emissions technologies to apply for funding from ARENA, Australian Renewable Energy Agency, and to apply for low interest loans from the CEFC, Clean Energy Finance Corporation. Now, as you would understand, that is not going down too well in inner city Melbourne, or inner city Sydney, or inner city Brisbane, but it's a very sensible approach. And when the Prime Minister came to the Hunter to announce more interest in the provision of gas-fired power in the New South Wales grid, with the support of the government-owned Snowy Hydro Limited and our own Paul Broad chortling up the back, he also commented on the future import importance of CCS in reducing emissions from industrial sources. Likewise, the head of the International Energy a Agency, Fatty Birrell, it's a nice name, isn't it, Fatty Birrell, uh, when asked about how we reduce long-term energy emissions, said, the most critical technology, in my view, is carbon capture, utilisation and storage. So it's not just us in letter who think that CCS and CCUS are really important in reducing emissions in energy, that view is shared at home and abroad. The other reason these technologies have a real future is their place in reducing emissions in other industries. And steel has been flirting with trying to use hydrogen in producing steel, but the latest work I've seen suggests that that may be 20 to 40 years away and in the meantime, CCS is one method of reducing the CO2 footprint in the process of making steel. And likewise, cement plants like this one at Berrima, if they are close to a suitable storage site, would be able to use CCS to reduce CO2 emissions from the production of cement. And of course, retrofitting CCS to existing plants may not be as attractive as building it into new plants. In the US, there's a new gasifier plant producing electricity using a different approach called the alum cycle. This makes the plant much more flexible and allows it to ramp up and down very quickly to increase or decrease the power generated. The plant has been using natural gas up to date as a fuel source and because of its design process it generates a concentrated stream of CO2. Now Letter is teaming up with the Allen Cycle team to investigate running on coal by adapting the combustor and turbine technology and they're already in discussions with potential funders in Australia for further work in both Victoria and Queensland. This plant gasifies the fuel and is then able to vary the outputs between power, hydrogen and ammonia based fertilisers. Consider a plant like this, situated in the heart of a good CCS storage area, using existing coal resources to produce near zero emissions power when required and then transferring across to produce hydrogen and fertiliser chemicals when the electricity demand is low. What a great backup and synergistic option for renewables. And earlier I said the, that debate about energy policy, and Hanny, this is just a gratuitous shot of the port. <laughs> I know where my bread's buttered. <laughs> earlier I said that uh, the debate about energy policy had concentrated more about the method of reaching the goal of lower emissions rather than the goal itself. I think this has been a bit to the detriment of all stakeholders. As Alan Finkel said, we can't just put up roadblocks and stop the industries responsible for the majority of the world's energy supply. We need all seven lanes. 
In Alan Finkel's world, that includes nuclear. Well, maybe in Australia we need all six lanes. CCS work is not seeking to replace the drive for a clean energy future through renewables. It's seeking to complement it and to give real attention to the more difficult and hard to abate sectors. There's no easy answer to these problems. There's no silver bullet. And some sectors will continue to generate emissions for longer than we would prefer. What's imperative is that as industry and as governments, we hone our focus to the goal itself, apply effort and finance into trying to develop the technologies and find things that work. The strength of our industry to find things that work and our ability to work together has been proven again this year with COVID-19 response that's kept communities and workers safe and the economy moving through real jobs like those undertaken by our third year apprentice, Olivia, who you can see on the screens. I think a strong New South Wales mining industry that keeps working together, be it responding to COVID-19 or on technologies such as carbon capture and storage, will keep meeting the challenges that come our way and will continue to drive the economy for many, many decades. Mm -hmm.